Over the last decade, extraordinarily low interest rates have made it difficult for investors to generate income within portfolios. While rates have risen over the past two years, so has bond market volatility, and a higher correlation between stocks and bonds has made the search for uncorrelated sources of income even more difficult. However, at the same time, infrastructure has built a strong track record of generating steady income while exhibiting low correlation to a traditional portfolio, and less sensitivity to economic and market risks given the essential nature of the assets. Against a backdrop of stretched valuations across risk assets and some uncertainty towards the outlook for monetary policy and inflation, there's no better time to discuss how investing in infrastructure can help build better portfolios. To share his views in the asset class, I'm joined by Nick Muller, an investment specialist and managing director within our infrastructure investment group. Nick has been with J.P. Morgan since 2006, and prior to his time in asset management, he worked in our investment bank, where he advised both public and private sector clients on executing infrastructure transactions. Now let's get started. Nick, welcome to Insights Now. Thank you very much. So Nick, infrastructure is something we all use in our daily lives, but it's relatively new as an asset class. So can we start by defining what do we mean by core infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is an important perspective because a lot of people understand what it means physically, but understanding what we mean from an investment perspective is very, very key. So traditionally, when we're thinking of core infrastructure, we're thinking the essentials of daily life, heat, water, gas, electric, that predominantly translates into regulated utilities, long-term contracted assets such as renewables, gas gen, storage, etc. So what we're talking about fundamentally is physically it's infrastructure, but it also has a long-term contracted or regulated revenue profile that provides a lot of the stability that we're looking for in this asset class. And so how should people think about that, uh, about fitting this asset class into a portfolio? Yeah, the way I always frame it, and it's a little cheesy but memorable, is DIY, diversification, inflation protection, and yield. And really, we're thinking about this asset class sort of in, in the middle of the risk spectrum, but complementing fixed income and equity allocations. I would say for the most part, people are thinking of this as a real asset. We'll probably uh, talk a little bit more about inflation along the way. So often people are expanding their real estate allocation to be real assets. I think mm -hmm. people should think about it in a similar sense. However, very importantly, it's also uncorrelated and diversified from real estate. So really complementing either a de-risking an equity allocation or potentially providing an alternative to sort of pure fixed income. Uh, and so what would you say the biggest trends are in the space right now? Is, is this a good time to invest in infrastructure? Well, it's always a good time, of course. But I, I do think as we step back, I think the underlying structural trend is key here. Even before you get to investment, whether private, public, government, etc., I think a lot of us understand conceptually the sheer amount of capital that needs to be invested, not just to build new infrastructure, but to replace much of the infrastructure we have. We're obviously sitting here in New York City and there's wooden pipes, things that need to be replaced. So I think the underlying structural trend is just the sheer amount of investment that's going to be needed over time. Obviously, we believe private investment has its place, but fundamentally that structural trend of we just need more of it, how we fund it, is likely to be a combination of all of the above. And that's certainly part of the reason we've seen growth in the asset class off a relatively low base. By asset class standards, it's quote unquote new, maybe 20 or so years. Mm -hmm. But really, it's that underlying demand or, or need that's really driving things. Yeah. Uh, and of course, people have, often, uh, have, I guess, always thought of infrastructure as a sort of a classic role for government. And, uh, and we have seen the government being much more active. Uh, just in the last few years with the um, the Infrastructure Act finally passed uh, and then the Inflation Reduction Act, which really I regard as sort of the Green, the green Transition Act. Yep. Um, how, how are these uh, government actions factoring into how we think about the space? Yeah, absolutely. We'll certainly talk about it a little bit more when we talk about risks, but there is no avoiding that governments, regulatory and political environments are absolutely key to infrastructure, whether government owned or, or government regulated. But I think the way we think about the Inflation Reduction Act, or frankly, any number of infrastructure folks' investments, it's really going to help facilitate and accelerate the investment that already needed to occur. So 
a lot of the things that the Inflation Reduction Act are driving were likely to occur in due time, but what this will do is help accelerate it. The way we think about it is it doesn't necessarily change today the things we can do. We've, I sort of tongue-in-cheek say, tactical and infrastructure is the next three to five years, mm. not the next three to five weeks. And fundamentally what we're talking about is the Inflation Reduction Act will likely incent more supply yep. of things to buy. So it will accelerate that. But I caution anyone thinking of this as sort of a, I can put a trade on today and make money tomorrow. It's really about, again, back to that broader point, what's the trend? It's very supportive of the long-term trajectory that we have here. And, and infrastructure is really not about trading, I guess. E exactly right. As soon as we hear trading mentality, it's not that that may not be an inappropriate investment. It's just going to have a very different profile than the DIY that I set out earlier. So when you think about the investments that we make in this space, uh, I think every, all asset classes are correctly getting another careful look now that we're talking about higher interest rates. I mean, yes. I used to say that when we had zero zero percent interest rates that it, the carrying cost of crazy was zero. So, <laughs> so you could basically do anything yes. and it didn't cost you anything to finance. Yep. And that was, you know, a, a sort of lack of discipline. But higher rates do add discipline, but they also raise questions about valuation. So uh, how do you feel about valuations across the infrastructure uh, asset class is a very broad asset class? Yeah, a very reasonable question, clearly, and probably the most frequent question we've had for the last 18 months. And I think I'd start by reminding people of sort of the, the valuation equation. For the most part, it's obviously projected cash flows discounted at a discount rate. Very, very obvious. I think the challenge is people sort of have a mental impression when we say stability, not much is changing. They think of it akin to long duration fixed income. Now, in reality, infrastructure is long lived, but not long duration. What do I mean by that? The discount rate might move around, but the cash flows are not static. And this is really where you get back to the inflation protection. Ultimately, if in principle, interest rates are moving with inflation, and obviously you'd have yeah. even closer views than that uh, uh, than me, but that's really what we've seen is both are moving somewhat together. And that's really the inflation hedge at work. The other piece is obviously the discount rate. And I think, and we'll get to this as well, historically infrastructure has been much more of an institutional asset class. I think in this context, that's important. There's a double side to, to this coin is we really didn't see infrastructure reprice in the same way in 2021 as maybe some other asset classes. I think part of that is the institutional nature. And it's also partly that, frankly, governments and regulators aren't setting regulatory structures based on spot treasuries, as much mm -hmm. as we love to talk about it in the investment context. So I think the punchline is we would say fairly valued, especially when one thinks about putting in a portfolio. That being said, there are always pockets of sectors which we would say have a bit more froth than others. But at a broad sense, we would see it as fairly valued. But I'll also say now, if we had the reverse, interest rates get cut, the economy booms, we wouldn't see it infrastructure to see the same upside. And that's really, I, I suppose that's why it is a real asset class is that it's really not about fixed income. It's it's about, about income that adjusts with the inflation interest rate environment. Absolutely right. And that's, that's really how we've mostly seen those on, I would say, the private wealth side think about this as a supplement to, to fixed income and stability, but not necessarily the same duration. So uh, another a very big part of this story, not just here in the United States, but actually all around the world, is ESG. Uh, yes. And there, there have been, uh, all, there's been a lot more focus on ESG and uh, ESG requirements and, and people trying to do things in, in an ESG way. How, how do you broadly think about ESG? Yeah, and it's obviously become a very uh, sort of, in some quarters, controversial or, yeah. or a lot of views there. What I would say is if we weren't doing ESG and infrastructure, we're doing it wrong. And so what do I mean by that? We generally think it of as GES, so governance comes first, ultimately, especially on the private side, the ability to implement various policies and, and resiliency, et cetera, comes from that active engagement. I think the E and the S tend to be a bit more intuitive, though. On the S side, you have customers regulators, politicians, if you're not doing the right things to interact with those entities, it's pretty clear what will happen to your risk-adjusted return. And obviously, we've already mentioned the Energy Transition, Inflation Reduction Act, but even when you think about weather resiliency, environmental law, infrastructure really goes hand-in-hand hand with ESG. So 
we would view it as being an integral part of risk and return. And obviously, there's risks and opportunities with the energy transition, but that's a key part of the investment dynamic. And I think that's, I mean, I know we were talking about this earlier about how you really think about ESG as, as uh, you know, GSE or GES, but as really governance comes first. And I think maybe, the, you know, the one sort of insight I get from this is this is not just a passive investing in a piece of infrastructure, not just buying it on the market. You're really, you know, getting into the, into the, into these companies and and helping direct strategies, which make sense given, you know, our experience and the, the, the size of our, our, our asset base in this area and, and our sort of years of experience, in it, but trying to help people Run this these projects in a way and and these transitions in a way that really does make sense. Yeah, a- absolutely. I think the earlier versions of infrastructure, people sort of had this impression that it's stable, it's boring. You just stick it on the shelf and it spits out cash. To your point, the active management of keeping the lights on, keeping people warm. Many cases, these companies have hundreds, if not thousands, of employees. So there's a necessity to have an active approach to achieve that outcome. And one has to only think of sort of natural disasters or financial crises, et cetera, where it really shows through active management is critical. Yeah, and I think, I think the, it's really important to have that broad experience and uh, both in terms of the, the infrastructure itself and also in terms of financial markets when, you, when you're thinking about the, those risks and that governance. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of risks, what do you think about, uh, how do you feel about risks in infrastructure, both sort of regulatory and operational? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I would say this is probably my other most frequently asked question, especially in this kind of year. People see the political headlines especially and think, why would I want anything to do with that? So let's step back for a second and first acknowledge, as I think I've already said, regulatory and political risk go hand in hand with these assets. I always remind everyone, though, that typically the reason you have that is because you're probably monopoly. You cannot be outcompeted as long as you're doing mm-hmm. the right things you're supposed to do for your regulators. So we would embrace political and regulatory risk because it is the other side of the risk coin. Operational risk is absolutely critical here. We've talked a lot about stability, cash flow, sort of visibility. That only comes if you can keep the assets running, mm-hmm. the lights on when storms hit, etc. So political risk, regulatory risk, operational risk are key. I would say also a lot of these risks are state and local. And so what I mean by that is as much as we see the the federal election headlines, the reality is they're mostly state and local regulated. So there's a bit more of a closer to the consumer when the lights stay on, don't stay mm-hmm. on, excuse me. Consumers don't tend to be very happy. So the final point I would make though is There's a reason you get a real and we think attractive rate of return. The beauty of it, though, is most of those risks tend to be very local and idiosyncratic. So even within an infrastructure portfolio, the sun shining in Texas, the wind blowing in California, regulatory decision in New York, they tend to be uncorrelated. So that gets back to the the D and the DIY. There are risks. The good news is they tend to be risks that are different than what investors are taking elsewhere, and it's. I mean, I, I guess the other thing is you, we sort of think about this this conflict between regulators and utilities, but really it's not that. I mean, a lot of this is they've got a very strong common interest in making sure the lights do stay on, and that means making sure that the operation's profitable, but also making sure that you're doing what is necessary on an operational basis to actually make sure you're not cutting corners, which ends up turning lights off. A- absolutely right, and it, it's obviously a balance. It may not always be gotten 100% perfect, but that's why in a broadly diversified portfolio, that's key. Everyone has interest in energy or heat being safe, affordable, and reliable, and that includes both the owners and the regulators. That's the ultimate objective. And of, and of course, then if you've been dealing for many years with many different groups of regulators across many different utilities and, and parts of the infrastructure framework, it, it gives you a certain amount of expertise and understanding where they're coming from and what, what's a, a sort of a win-win compromise in terms of uh, you know, making sure that the, the operation is profitable and uh, very efficient at what it does. Absolutely. And I think this is where it gets back to a little bit of the ESG. Long-term perspective is really critical here. Regulators and customers generally want someone that's alongside them for the yeah. long term. So it's a very different, if you will, investment approach than maybe some other private asset classes, not necessarily for bad or good, but that's really what's necessary given the nature of these assets. So... I guess last question then is, as we talk about this as, as an investment, um, is there much of a movement to make this more available to investors broadly, or is this very much for high net worth individuals or institutions? 
Yeah, so I, I sort of take that from a couple of perspectives. Maybe let me first start with on the on the public side. There's absolutely liquid listed options available. Obviously, the the sort of caveat to that is they tend to come with public market beta in terms of the valuations. We would generally say also that publicly listed infrastructure, if one looks under the hood, it tends to skew a little bit more what we would core plus. Maybe has a little bit more development, has a little bit more unregulated, because ultimately they're aspiring to grow their earnings per share. Yeah. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a bit of a different profile. So obviously that's available publicly to everyone, but maybe doesn't quite have the same DIY as we would term it. At the other end of the spectrum, certainly private infrastructure has predominantly been an institutional asset class, frequently closed-end private equity fund orientated. What we've seen is a shift over time to more perpetual structures, whether institutionally focused or what I would say private wealth focused. At this point, it is sort of high net worth individual or institutional focus, but we're absolutely seeing an evolution of the space over time. And I would anticipate more vehicles as time goes on. And, and, then, and there is actually one small point, but I think it may be quite important here in terms of closed end funds with money sitting on the sidelines waiting to get yes. invested, whereas you're basically able to you pretty much try and invest every dollar. Yeah. When we think about perpetual structures, in addition to it already being deployed and available, to your point, these closed-end funds have very short periods, a lot of dry powder, and as we talked earlier, maybe there's a mismatch between what customers and regulators and the nature of these assets want. And so I, I sort of think about it as maybe we're 20 or 30 years behind where private real estate was, but we're certainly seeing that evolution over time. And look, selfishly, I hope that that continues. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember, I remember after the... Uh after the great financial crisis, one of the, the government attempts to, to move the economy was investing in shovel-ready ready projects. And I was always very skeptical. Are you sure this is shovel-ready? But it really, we're not, we're not getting invested until it is shovel-ready and we're ready to put the shovels in the ground. Exactly. And that's a really important point here is that, and this sort of goes back to the, the footnote, if you will, on the Inflation Reduction Act. For the most part, that's going to be development orientated. Now, there is a place for that. That's clearly a different risk profile. When we think about core, we're absolutely focused on either about to go into construction or operating projects. Again, it's not a uh, bad thing to go earlier stage, but as one thinks about what that means for risk and return, obviously the, the markets have done very well in the mm -hmm. last few, few years. What we're really positioning for in core is if we do get a recession or a weaker sure. economic environment. Not that we wish it. You'll have views on that. But that's what the asset class is positioned for. So lower lows and maybe not as higher highs. But again, that's the diversification at work. Absolutely. And, that, and that, that's so, so critical. I mean, it's, you always try and diversify not because of what you expect, but because of stuff you don't expect that ends up biting you. Exactly so, right. Uh, well, Nick, I have learned so much about infrastructure. So, so thank you so much for joining us on Insights Now. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. On our next episode, I'll sit down with Doug Schwartz, co-president and portfolio manager within our Real Estate Americas platform for a discussion on real estate. To all our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in today and speak with you soon.